And like most researchers, I'm not the only person involved here. You know, there's a team of, team of us working, and so I'm going to report on a, on a few of the different projects. And, and, and I've got a lot of work here at the end, which is about the Surat Basin and what we've done a big survey in Brisbane recently, which we haven't released yet. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you some of the, what the community views are about some of the, um, the, uh, the coal seam gas issues on the Surat. And that work's been funded through um, a minerals future cluster project. Okay, so I'll, I'll just get into it and I'm going to slip through the first couple because Paul's already covered macroeconomic effects. The first topic that I'm going to talk about is the land allocation issue because a lot of the people that I deal with in um, dealing with coal and gas issues say, can't we just ignore this? Shouldn't we just reserve the land for primary production, for, you know, for cattle or, or farming? And you can really see this issue starting to bite. Um, you know, in Queensland it's about agricultural production, but in New South Wales it's, I call it the Nicole Kidman um, problem. Um, and, uh, you know, a few, whoops, um, about mid last year, uh, the, um, the Weekend Australian, um, front page of the Weekend Australian, had a big photo of Nicole Kidman's house on a beautiful place on the western outskirts of Sydney. And, and they've got, um, she and Keith have got big acreage there, you know, it might be 50 acres or something. And why was it on the front page of the Australian? Well, there's all this fuss because suddenly one of those wretched coal seam gas companies had got a permit to drill in exploratory holes on Nicole Kidman's problem, property. And she was up in arms about it and they were running a public, um, a major petition to try to get it banned. And I think the exploration in New South Wales has been banned. But of course, that raises the question, if it's such an issue to Nicole Kidman and she can try to do something about it, what about all of those people that's at, in the blocks at Surat? or in other places where you've got this coal seam gas close to home. So, so the, the issues about this, this land access, um, when it's rural lifestyle land, um, is, is big issues for some people as well. So let's, um, let's look at the dollars involved, because that's, as an economist, I was interested to work out, well, what's, what's the trade-off here? So, uh, as you are aware, most of the land in Queensland is, um, is used for agriculture, uh, for grazing. And, and land use by, by mining is actually tiny, tiny little red dots on this map. It, it adds up to less than 0.1 of 1%. So it's pretty small, but it's increasing rapidly. So how, how should we make some of those decisions? I've got two case study examples I've worked through. One is for a coal mine west of Mackay. We actually did the economic impact assessment for it. So I had the figures very, uh, some pretty good figures. And it's a small mine, 4 million tonnes a year. So it's not one of the, nothing the size of these new ones at Alpha that are proposed. Fairly short lifetime, um, and it was going to, uh, the footprint's about um, 4,000 acres. Not, not all of it will be mined, but it's a, but it's a fairly, you know, they're, they're trying to buy a section of the property out. So the question was, uh, it was a serious question at the time, should we reserve that land, it is good buffalo country, should we reserve it for cattle, or is it more worthwhile to dig it up for coal? And, and this shows you um, the amount of money um, that you get from coal. So the, the red line um, at the top shows you the amount of money that comes in every year uh, for coal. It's about nearly, it's about $430 million a year in sales. And, um, and the, there's about nearly $250 million in costs. And the profit, a bit over $100 million a year um, for the 16 years of operation. The, um, the red line down the bottom, very close to the bottom, is the profit that we've estimated out of the cattle and that's, that, that's being the most generous that I can, I can make it. And we, of course we've estimated that into infinity. We've, we've, because the coal mine only runs for the first 16 years and stops, cattle keeps going forever. But even when we count for that cattle going forever, the coal works out about 200 times better. So you can see why governments um, uh, you know, are, 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 drive, are, are going to allocate these resource projects out because the returns are so high as well as generating jobs and, and royalties to government. So, so for coal, there's a huge difference. 
let's look at gas. Gas is a bit different. Uh, as you know, you've got these footprints. Um, the footprints are pretty small. And, and I worked out on the Darling Downs and the Surratt Basin that, um, that your loss of productive land, it's about 1.5% of your land. And, and of course, if you get the right design, you can probably minimise that problem a bit further. Um, but, and, and this is for fairly close spacing. So every three quarters of a kilometre, some of the gas wells that are around now, they're starting to, um, to spread them out a bit, so they're more like a kilometre apart. Or in the Acadia Valley, the gas wells that they're putting in there, they seem they tend to be, must be because of the geology, they're putting down bigger wells, but even further apart. So, so it varies a bit. But on the Darling Downs, they're fairly close together. And the footprint is about, a, about you know, between 1% and 2%. So, one of the companies, um, this is one of the, there's four big companies there, and so the, the one that's running third in terms of timing is APLNG. And each company will roughly develop about 10,000 wells. Um, and so for APLNG, that'll mean that they'll directly tie up about 10,000 hectares over the whole of the Darling Downs. And, and it won't be forever. You know, they, they dig a well, they run it until the gas expires, which is usually after about 10 to 15 years, and then they go back and cover it up and rehabilitate. So on the farming ground, it will eventually return to farming, which is completely different to coal, which is when you dig it up, I'm very suspicious that there'll ever be any much productive use of that land. So for APLNG, they'll add about 900 million um, to the, um, in, in terms of value of output every year. And um, the, the, um, the government, the, the value of, of that over, you can work it, work it out a couple of different ways, but basically the value of that resource is up towards $2 billion. And, and in terms of, if for the good farming land, it works out about 20 times better. Um, if it is grazing land, pastoral land, it's probably you back up in the one to 200 times. With a very good farming land, it's getting close to the point it's where you'd say it's probably not worth the risk. So if it's only 10, 20 times better, why take the risk? But certainly on most of the land there, on the dry land country and on the grazing land, the gas, in terms of the economics, is, um, is way in front of agriculture. And that explains why there's so much activity. OK, so. Given that there's that the economics, in, in the very simple economics, say this resource generates a lot more money, here, here's how much more. Why the level of protest? And here I want to talk about where the money's going, um, what are the effects on communities, and I won't talk about the environmental environmental risks so much, but I will talk a bit about um, what um, the bigger population thinks. Okay, so the. I think one of the big problems is that the regional areas don't share in the wealth very much. So you have these mining developments, these resource developments, um, there's extra jobs created, but now with fly in, fly out, not a lot of people necessarily live in the area. Um, the, uh, particularly in coal, not so much in gas, but in coal we're starting to see these huge industrial type of activities where really everything's run in and out of capital cities. So even the regions don't... Um, get as much benefit as they used to. We've done some work assessing where, um, where people are paid in Queensland and, and this little map gives you a bit of a, uh, a pictorial uh, description. Almost not a, a fair chunk of salaries, about a third of salaries actually go to Brisbane already and about nearly, not quite half, I think over 40% go to South East Queensland. So that's a lot of head office effects. But a lot of people live in Brisbane and commute, or they live on the Gold Coast and commute, and that type of effect is increasing. Um, and you can see there that the big salary winners are the, uh, you know, the, the Mackay area, the Central Highlands and Mount Isa, as well as um, Gladstone and Townsville. Uh, the, uh, Gladstone because you've got minerals processing, um, and Townsville because it's a base for people to fly in and out to both Mount Isa and, um, and the coal fields. Uh, and as soon as you come a bit further west, there's a few, there's a bit of money coming into this region, and that's because of people living here and driving, uh, drive in, drive out to, to mining operations. So mining is actually bringing quite a wealth, quite a bit of wealth here already, but it's not 
as much as it is in other parts of the state. We then looked at where the business chain money was going. So for all of the mines, we worked out where they were spending money, um, buying fuel and tyres and repairs and all those sort of things. And you can see here it's much more concentrated to the coast. Here Brisbane gets more than 50% um, of the business chain. And you've got the few big centres, particularly Mackay, uh, which gets about 16% of the state's business expenditure from the resources sector. And then Gladstone and Townsville and Mount Isa. And, uh, and as you come further west, uh, once you're further west of Emerald, there's, there's pretty limited business spending. But of course, that's the attraction of new industry coming, that um, your business spend will go up and your supply chain uh, <coughs> will generate new jobs. So when I, I put this together, uh, I've looked at all of the expenditure in the state and, and, and the resources sector accounts, uh, on my estimates, about 21% of the state's economy or drives about 21% of the state's economy. And when I put this together, you can see it makes a pretty big difference to central Queensland. Uh, and once you get to the western Queensland, apart from Mount Isa, uh, it's much quieter. And you can see the little bit of effect from um, the oil industry down in the far southwest of the state where there's a bit of money running through to there. But once you get to, you have to get to Roma before it starts to pick up in terms of the economy there. So Roma's managing to capture some of that already. So, so what we've, um, th this gives you a bit of a feeling for, even down in the Darling Downs, which is um, you know, traditionally very agriculture, the, the, the resources sector, so coal, gas and, and oil, it was accounting for about 6% of the employment there um, in the whole region. And, and particularly uh, in the Western Downs, particularly Roma. So it's driving about a fifth of the Roma economy. And, and for, um, for Roma, roughly for every job created in the resources sector, there's about another 2.3 jobs. So the multiplier effects are fairly strong. But of course, when you go to, to some other areas, if you go to Mackay, multiplier effects much, much larger. The problem seems to be that um, in, in some of the smaller communities, even if you get an extra job, still quite a lot of the expenditure goes out. If you go to the uh, Isaac Regional Council, inland from Mackay, uh, I estimate the multiplier there is, is less than one. It's about 0.7. And the problem there is that um, because it's so expensive to live there in those mining towns, that even though there's lots of income, most of those people spend their money away on the coast. So they don't create many extra jobs in their local area, they create lots of extra jobs in Mackay and Brisbane and, and, and wherever they go to, to spend money. So, so there's, um, there's no doubt that the resources sector drives the state economy. It's, it's a huge driver uh, and it's growing. That's why it's so popular. But the problems are that more than 50% of that wealth flows to Brisbane. So that a lot of the, even though the resources development's happening, a lot of the wealth effects occur elsewhere. And I think that the, um, the share of wealth in the regional areas is actually falling. And it's going to fall further. And the reasons for that are that people tend to spend, have got a greater propensity to spend money outside. One of the problems we see in, in rural towns is that when, when they get um, wealthier, people actually tend to spend more money away from the town than, than when they pour. Um, uh, uh, the other things that are happening is that as new people come in, they tend to spend back where they came from, and we're starting to see a lot more fly in, fly out, and in future we're going to see a lot more automation, so the jobs won't even be in the regional areas. So those are some of the issues with the distribution of the regional impacts. Um, mining brings wealth, but it's not um, evenly distributed. There's a, we've had a bit of a go at estimating some of the population changes for the, for the region. And this is, so mining brings wealth and brings jobs. And when we, multi, when we use our economic models to work out where the jobs are going to go, um, this might be good news and bad news. Uh, it, just for the central Queensland region, we think that most of the job creation is going to be outside of the region. Um, for all the new projects here, about 70%. But of the 30% of jobs that will be generated in the next, um, what, eight or ten years here, we see the, the bulk of them, the blue area is in Mackay. Um, the next biggest 
bunch is the green zone, that's in Gladstone. Uh, the next biggest bunch is, uh, is, Mac is Rockhampton, that's the red. Uh, I think the, the fourth bar from the, from the top is, um, is probably Bundaberg. We see that Bundaberg's going to actually get more benefit from drive-in, drive-out to Gladstone and fly-in, fly-out to, um, to other parts of the country. And the, and the bar called in Central West region is one of those tiny little bars towards the top. So we think there's going to be job growth here and the population is going to grow, not decline, but it's going to be fairly small. Uh, now, uh, this, is a, this is a model. We've, we've had to make a lot of heroic assumptions about where people are going to live for projects and how much fly-in, fly-out there is going to be. But, but at this stage, we expect that, um, particularly in, uh, in with, um, with gas in the longer term, it tends to have, um, uh, create, have a lot of wealth creation but the jobs are fairly limited. So, and this is pretty, pr pretty consistent with other parts of Queensland. Me. Okay, let me just talk now about some of the other impacts. I might just go straight through to, to the, um, the first big issue. The, the, the big issue with, with mining impacts is housing. And again, it, it's like everything dealing with these issues, there's good and bad. So often um, the new jobs that come in, and it's particularly uh, around both the development stages and the operational stages, we get this demand for housing. And often these projects come, they start up, they're quick to start, they rapid development, and you just can't, even if you plan ahead, you can't build the houses in time to meet the needs of the project. So we get this pressure on housing. And the problem is that this is a transmission link between your economic drivers and your social issues. So that when you get high housing prices, you often have other impacts on the rest of your economy. There are impacts on the rest of your business world because suddenly they increase costs to get people here. And there are impacts on your social drivers because suddenly it's harder for people who don't have the high income to live in these smaller communities. It seems really difficult to address. So what we're seeing in... Um, now is a lot more attention paid by the development companies and by government to these housing issues. And this is where uh, the, the gas, the coal seam gas companies in the Surat Basin are actually right at the lead of trying to do something about it. So they're investing a lot in social housing initiatives and they're trying to make sure that they have minimal impact on their communities. Compared to what the coal companies get away with where they basically have new projects and they don't address housing very much at all, um, the coal seam gas companies have been much more proactive. But it's the big issue. So for the small communities uh, where you've got developments, the thing to focus on is to make sure that there is commitments to build houses or to address affordable housing initiatives. Because if you, if you have high house prices, suddenly it's really difficult to, to um, deal with other impacts on your community. Okay, let me just talk now. Uh, sorry, I'll go back. I'll go back to about the results of a study we've done on the Surat. So this this is one we've done. It's only about a month old. We've well, we've we, I think we've done the survey at the beginning of March. We've written the report. We haven't shown it to anybody yet. And. Um, and we've, we've asked uh, a large number of households in Brisbane about their views on the development scenarios for the Surat Basin. And what we've explained to them is, you know, these developments are going to create a lot of jobs. We've, we've estimated what the jobs are going to be in the Surat Basin as distinct from elsewhere in the state, particularly Brisbane. So we've worked out roughly what, from our models, how many jobs there'll be. We've said there's going to be higher housing prices. We just can't avoid it because there's housing shortages there. There's going to be an increase in wage costs, which means that there's impacts on other businesses there. It's good and bad. You know, it increases the income into those towns and into the region, but it makes it harder for other businesses. Um, the, we wanted to do something with about the environmental safety issues, and what we've said is, at the moment, all of the mines have to monitor all of their all of their wells for water quality. And we've explained that at the moment the government does independent testing for about 10 per cent. And so what we've suggested is that um, the government could spend more money and do more independent testing. And we've said, if you want to, 
if you want to change any of these effects, we'd have to slow development down, and that'd mean that to have the same standard of living in the future, you'd have to pay more tax. You know, that at the moment, these gas developments are increasing the state's wealth. If you do without the developments, it's going to cost somewhere along the line. OK, so that's sort of the basis of, what, of how we've tried to, to depict the issues. This is um, a bit of a, a snapshot of what people came up with and said were the most important things. So, so the most important things, slightly, are the possible environmental effects. So that's, that's slightly the biggest issue. But very closely associated with that is the impacts on housing costs and the new jobs that are created. So even though the environmental issues have been out in the forefront of the media, um, those three issues, which are not always, which are a bit offsetting, uh, are pretty close. And then inf local infrastructure, so pressures on roads and those sort of things were, was the other bigger issue. This is a, an example of one of the choice sets we gave people. We asked people to make these complex choices, saying, well, you, you can't have everything, you know. You, and so we said, well, we can come up with scenarios where we can reduce the impact on, um, uh, on housing and we can reduce the impact of, of wage costs on local businesses but it would mean there'd be less jobs in mining. Um, we could have better environmental monitoring, but it would mean that your taxes over time would rise because there wouldn't be as much profit coming out of the mining industry to subsidise the government. So, so we gave people a whole heap of these different choices and we tried to work out from that what was most important to them. And, and I'm just going to show you one slide to show the, the complexity of how people think about this. So, so we, in essence, we found five, you could group people in Brisbane into about five different groups in the way they viewed these coal seam gas issues. The first group, um, the orange bars are the people who are really concerned about the environmental risks. So, so you can see there's actually three, three out of the five groups were really concerned about the environmental risks. And, uh, and the first group is about a quarter of the population but they're actually more concerned about losing the money. So they, they're really concerned about the environment and they're really concerned about money. So if you go to them and say, we can reduce the environmental risks, but it's going to mean you're going to get less money, um, not, clear, not clear which way they jump. The second group, they're, they're concerned about a little bit about money, not so much. They're, um, they're concerned about housing, they're concerned about jobs. Um, they're concerned about um, business effects, but they're mostly concerned about the environment. The third group, mostly concerned about housing impacts. So the, so the thought that people's cost of housing is going to go up was, a, was the thing for them that had drive their choices. And that's about 20% of the population. The fourth group, the environment's the thing that drives them. It doesn't matter almost what any of the other effects are. Um, increased environmental risks uh, is, is for them the key. And the fifth group, which is also nearly a quarter of the population, are driven by jobs. So for them, just increasing the number of jobs is the dominant thing they're looking for when they're going to make choices. So this starts to give a bit of a feeling for how difficult it is for government to, to deal with these issues, because you've got these different um, drivers and groups in society that are wanting very different outcomes or have very different um, ways of, of trading off the outcomes. And, uh, and, and you can see that all of those issues are important in some way to the different groups. Okay, just um, two or three more things. We asked people about whether it's worth putting some bans on coal seam gas development. And, and we asked them a few key areas. First one was prime agricultural land. And we got two-thirds of the population saying, yes, there should be bans there. Um, the second one was within 10 kilometres of, um, of major towns, residential areas. And we got a yet two-thirds again there, yes. But if we increased it to 20 kilometres, suddenly the support dropped to a third. Um, we got a lot of support, more than two-thirds, for, uh, for banning development where there was... Uh, protected biodiversity on private land, but almost only about half support for where you've got important biodiversity 
on private land that's not protected. So, so there's some support for protecting, for banning a development where you've got things like nature reserves or high conservation areas that are recognised. But if it's not something that's already been recognised, that doesn't have some sort of a title over, it's it, not public support to to ban development. And and the final thing of interest, this is before the um, this is a government election. We asked people about whether they'd support a royalties for regions approach, where the royalties from mining activities were then paid back and invested back in the regions where that money was generated. And you can see that, uh, that um, just we, we got 42% of the Brisbane population supported the money going back to the region where it came from. And this is for oil royalties. You know, the, the Queensland government policy is only for about 10% of royalties, or the, the new LNP policy is for about 10% of royalties to go back to the regions. Um, and, and, and only 20% of people in Brisbane said that they want the royalties to come to them, which is effectively what occurs at the moment, because the money from royalties just goes back into the government guzzle account and gets spent where the population base is in Queensland. So, so recommendations. Um, the, the money differences are so high, the money flows in favour of, of resources is so large that I don't think there's, that there's going to be much change to government policy. Um, so the trick is to try to then work with these projects and, um, and get the best deal for the region and the individual <coughs> landholders that's possible. I argue a lot for making sure that residential location is an open choice so that we get the, as much as possible we get workers able to live in the regions where they work and, and one way of doing that is uh, when you've got coal mines and coal seam gas projects is to keep um, block shifts as short as possible. Um, very important to get as much housing available at the, at the um, beginning of a project so you avoid these huge housing costs and to make um, local towns attractive to live in. And that's where I think the royalties for regions approach can come in. If you can make sure that those royalties get invested back into towns, um, then I think that there's a, a, a lot better opportunity for these local areas to benefit out of the um, resource developments. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.